reporting on the games you love by people who love to game. The MMO Reporter Network. Friends, and welcome to episode 9 of the Game Dip Map Podcast, a bite sized show about the great games you might have missed. I'm your host, Josh Augustine, and today I want to tell you about how I killed entire legions of sheep with just a dragon, an archer, a swordsman, and a telepathic spirit dominating bossy lady. It all happened in Defender's Quest, Valley of the Forgotten. I, I mean, up front, can we just agree to just call it Defender's Quest? I don't want to have to say like 20 syllables title every time so let's just call it defender's quest cool cool all right so defender's quest is an addictive tower defense game with fantasy rpg elements and an incredible amount of slick features that gives you lots to tinkle with so it's created and published by three cool dudes working under the banner of level up labs i'll put links in the show notes but you should definitely follow at least one of the devs uh, lars Doucette. If you care about the games industry at all, he regularly makes really great blog posts. and just gives tons of data about how he sold games, what he's done with games, all the sorts of stuff, uh, and just game design philosophies in general. There's this really cool bottle principle he has that's just really great. So if you care about games, follow him on. I'll put links there. Um, the game was released on PC in 2012, four years ago. What? But... A revamped version of the game was released in June of this year, which is what we'll be talking about today. It has better graphics, more features, all sorts of good stuff. And if you buy the game on Steam right now, that's what you're going to get. Technically, you get both bundled and you can choose which one to launch, but just play the deluxe version. Um, They've also been building a sequel for the game for a couple years now, but they're also building the engine that they use. It's really cool. It's all open source, their whole engine. Uh, So it goes a little slower because they're upgrading the engine and all that sort of stuff while they're making the game. Uh, But I just, I really respect what these guys are doing. They're they're just kind of this really cool indie group that's making game engines and making games, all of it open source. Just really cool. So let's dive right into the fun. Let's take a look at how you play Defender's Quest. So it's a 2D top-down tower defense strategy game. So each level takes place on a specific set of terrain. Uh, And it's a tower defense game, right? So there's going to be routes the enemies will walk or run or swim down, and they race towards some objective. In this case, they're trying to kill your big hero that's in the back, you know, controlling everything. And you need to place stationary fighters in locations around the map who will automatically attack anything that gets near them. Or some of them are ranged and that sort of stuff. But you place them down, they stay where they are, and then when enemies rush through the gauntlet of heroes you placed, in theory... Uh, you've placed them in such a way that none of the runners get through, and then you beat the level. But of course, like most tower defense games, it's never as simple as it sounds, right? Some enemies sprint sprint really quickly. Some will just stop and fight and eat the face of whoever they see. (laughs) Um, So they may just eat your heroes, and that'll disrupt your plans as you're going. And then some will be resistant to certain types of attacks and vulnerable to others. You know, like the water dude can't be hurt by fire, but uh, I don't know, stones? What, What beats water? poisonous chemicals there you go throw some poisonous chemicals at that water elemental no he's a poison elemental now i guess that actually just makes him stronger are water elementals like the greatest enemy in a game what could beat them i don't know this is tough oh ice yeah you need ice because then you just freeze them and then you smash them with a hammer and then you make snow cones out of them and eat them it's delicious Anyways, (laughs) Anyways, <laughs> there you go. There's your pro tip for beating Defender's Quest. Make snow codes. <laughs> um, and, you know, sometimes they'll just make new new paths through the game, which is always exciting when you're like, okay, I've built my perfect defense against this. And all of a sudden, like, the giant just busts through the, d- the door and just like, nope, we're coming at you from this side now. No, what have I done? Um, so anyways, Defender's Quest just has a lot of cool ways to keep you on your toes, like tower defense games do. You have to re-evaluate your strategy constantly, make some snap decisions to solve problems. But the biggest difference between other tower defense games I've played and this one is the focus on story and these RPG elements. Uh, so we'll talk about that a lot. You know, instead of building towers or placing bunkers, which is what you do in most tower defense games, you're like, oh, here's a turret, here's a Gatling gun, that sort of stuff. Here you're recruiting heroes that play roles in the story and you have dialogues with and you talk with and they can interact with uh, and all sorts of stuff. We'll get into how you upgraded them. 
Um, so you recruit an archer, a berserker, a mage, a dragon, all sorts of cool fantasy. It's very high fantasy in that way. Um, it's all the classic stuff you'd expect. Mages, wizards, priests. Uh, and then, of course, each of those characters have their own XP bars, talent trees, AI for how they fight. So it's not just set it and forget it like some tower defense games are where you're just building a turret and leave it there. Each of your heroes is like a complex tool that you have to figure out how to wield properly. So as you collect more followers and fight your way through the story, you take on bigger challenges and conquer them together through the power of friendship. And swords. Swords really help a lot. It, maybe even more than friendship, you need swords. Swords and maybe some bows and some staves. But you gotta have friendship in there too. All right, let's take a look at seven reasons you need to drop everything you're doing right now and immediately play this game. Reason number one, the brilliant writing and characters will make even the curmudgeoniest of curmudgeons laugh. So I'm having a hard time thinking of a game. I, I spent some time before the show thinking about this, trying to think of a game that made me laugh this regularly at the characters and dialogue. And so I don't want to make this comparison, right? It's not quite as clever or witty as Monkey Island which is my holy grail for game humor. So I don't want to put it in that same category because really nothing is in that category for me. Monkey Island is just on a whole pier. But the game is... Um, Defender's Quest is really good at taking kind of cliche character stereotypes and playing around with them in fun ways uh, with some absurd humor thrown in there that just keep you guessing it. <laughs> it's just really fun. Like, uh, so the very first hero you recruit to your team is this berserker guy. He has no sh shirt, a big sword, not wearing a shoe, or maybe one shoe. He's just like this total goofball. He loves to brag about how awesome he is. He loves to talk about just like the weirdest stuff he picks on. Where like you cross a wagon and he starts arguing with you that he wants to take the wagon and, I don't know, take it on a trip. I don't, I forget what it is. He doesn't want to wear shoes at some point or, or why wearing a shirt doesn't make him fight better. Like he's just constantly throwing out these really weird arguments and statements. And then, uh, the, the mechanic that you do in the tower defense is like your character can like pull the spirits out of people and like control them. And that's how they put them in the tower defense thing. And like when he gets pulled into the spirit world, he starts having fun with it and just messing around with you. He just, he just gets on these tangents and just goes with it. It's really entertaining to watch. And it's also, I will say, the, this is the very first game since Mass Effect that made me actually want to read the text journal. Like, so many games put the little text journal in, like, Codex Entry Unlocked. Yeah, I don't want to sit there and read that in most cases. But in this one, it's awesome. So it's written as, like, the journal of the main character. It's not, it's like your diary, but a diary makes it sound like it's, like, personal feeling stuff. It's more like a log, a battle log of what they're doing, keeping track of their adventures. But she does put in tons of hilarious commentary on the things that happen. So it's not just, like, we killed Drogdor. We have freed the people of the fort. It's it's all her like putting funny twists and like so uh, this weird berserker guy did this thing today and I can't believe he did that. It it, it just I don't know. I, I wish I'd come up with <laughs> better examples before I recorded this. Uh, as I'm saying this now, I realize I should have done that. Um, but it's just it's really funny. Lots of commentary about the people you interact with and just the crazy world that you're traveling through. And at one point, <laughs> my favorite part of the journal. The crazy berserker guy actually finds the journal and sees what's been what she's been writing about him and then starts writing his own entries like to overlap hers because you're reading the journal and you're just like, what? This like totally contradicts what is happening. And then you're like, wait a second. This is just bragging about how cool this other guy is. Then the next one is her writing back to him. Don't you ever touch my stuff again? And it's just super silly. It's lighthearted. It's funny. All right. Reason number two, you get to name all of your characters anything you want anything uh, now i kind of love naming characters in games a lot like it's probably weird to, to to some people but i love it so if this isn't a big plus for you move on but i thought it was super cool you know i got to name all the characters i recruited i've done two playthroughs now and so i've gone with different themes because i really wanted to feel like cohesive and my team to be like you know the next lord of the rings uh fellowship 
So the first run through, I went with Greek gods and goddesses because Greek mythology is just my thing. I love it. It's so like the crazy berserker guy was Apollo. The angry archer was Artemis. The main character was Athena and the priest was Hermes. All that sort of stuff is fun. But the second playthrough, I went for something a little more fun. Muppets! <laughs> my main character was Miss Piggy. Crazy Berserker was Fozzie Bear. And of course, the big dragon Hulk in the back. That was Sweetums. Uh, I love Sweetums so much. So good. Um, so it's just one of the small touches that add a sense of charm and completeness to this game. This is the sort of thing that like a lot of indie games are missing. Like when you're looking at a schedule for making a game, na being able to name characters saying that, oh, well, that gets cut because that's not essential, right? And they want to get the game out. They have a small team. But this game just has so many of those small features that individually, okay, who cares? You're not going to buy the game because you can name it. But when it's all over the place, there's just these little touches when you're just constantly surprised. Oh, I can do that? That's cool. Like There are AAA games that don't let you do this sort of thing. Uh, it, it, there's just so many cool features, and it feels so deep and real on like a mechanical and gameplay level that if it had like fancier graphics, it could totally be a AAA title. Although I will say, the new graphics that they added in the Deluxe Edition look great, right? Because the first version of the graphics were pretty bad, if we're being honest. It's still 2D characters that are mostly kind of like uh, Vexel... Uh, what is that? Vexel art? Vector art. Vector art? It's like super plain 2D art. Yeah, I don't know. They don't animate or that sort of stuff. Um, In-game, they kind of animate when they attack, but during the cutscenes, they're just there, and they'll change poses every now and then, and they're just talking heads. Um, but... It looks good enough that it's like, okay, this is fun. I can buy into it. I have no idea how I got on that tangent there. Um, the art is cool. <laughs> there you go. Has nothing to do with naming your characters. Reason number three. Librarians have superpowers in this world. But before we unpack that wonderful fact, which is a fact, let's just talk about some of the cool features that make the game so robust. Uh, so speed. You can pause the game at any time and adjust the speed to make you go faster or slower at any time. You can assign special AI to each character, which will affect who they choose to target. And you can change that AI on, on the fly during the match. You can say attack the nearest, the, attack the lowest health, attack whatever. I forget what all the options are. But if you, if you really wanted to, right, you could put a ton of time and turn it into like a turn-based manual targeting game. Because you could pause it, unpause Change all the AI. Okay, you're going to attack this one. Pause it, pause it, do it. And you could do that over and over and like literally control every single attack of all your people. But thankfully, you are not expected to. <laughs> I usually just pause at the start to get everyone set up and then just pause whenever things start to get hairy, right? When I start to panic and be like, ah, they broke through the wall and now there's another route. Pause it, figure out what's going on. And then I could take the time and move things around and kind of maybe put it in slow motion until I get some breathing room and then crank back up to full speed to get through and grind out some loot, you know? Know what I'm saying? You, you like grinding that loot? I like grinding that loot. Maybe we could just grind some loot together. Anyways, this is not a co-op game. <laughs> Your main hero, who, by the way, is a librarian. This is what I'm talking about here with some sort of superpowers. Like, I think librarian is like a code word for like crazy wizard in this world. Because like people are like, whoa, you're a librarian? Which in general, people don't do. I worked at a library for a while and no one was ever very impressed that I worked at a library. Uh, but here, uh, she can, you know, possess other people's bodies or pull out their spirits and make them do stuff. I don't totally understand what's happening. I think it was explained at one point. But it's basically just how they explain that she's the tower defense leader. She sits in the back hulking out and then everyone else does whatever she wants and then on top of that because her librarian superpowers also give her other powers she can occasionally like zap enemies with lightning or boost everyone's attack speed or stuff like that she but all those powers cost uh psi uh which leads us to our next point oh look at this <laughs> i actually planned it out this time woot woot reason number four characters have many viable build paths so in addition to like buying the usual stuff, like buying equipment, selling equipment, boost their stats, that sort of stuff, you have some really cool control over the character's upgrade mechanics. Like in the metagame, so your heroes are reaching levels, and they're leveling up like they would in an RPG, because they get XP at the end of every fight based on how they killed, if nobody got through, that sort of stuff, they get bonuses. And as they reach higher levels, they unlock more talents that you can choose to spend points in. So things like uh, if they have a fireball attack, they, the talent will in, add a damage over time effect to it. So every time it hits, it leaves like a dot on it. Or their lightning attack will chain and bounce to multiple enemies. Or, you know, just flat stat boost. Hey, they regen a ton of health, so now they can tank on the front line. That sort of stuff. And all that metagame stuff is cool, but what I thought was really interesting to me was how it handles like in 
inside each match. So inside the match, you use Psy to buy anything. You can buy abilities, upgrades, that sort of stuff. So you're given some at the very start to build your initial defenses. Okay, place this dude here, place this dude here. And then every time you kill an enemy, you get a little bit more, and you can upgrade them over the course of a match. Um, but it's not just upgrading the hero to deal more damage, right? It's kind of like the talent trees, where each hero has a combo of attacks that they have. So they have like anywhere between like two and five attacks that they'll do. And so... For example, let's just go through an example. It'll be easier. So the Berserker has this chin where he'll attack, then do a heavy attack, and then a big arc and cleave attack that's slow but hits everyone nearby, and it's really powerful. But he has to do the first two to build up to it. But if you don't upgrade him, he's only going to have access to that first attack. So he'll just do a simple attack over and over and over. If you upgrade him once, boom, he'll do attack, heavy attack, attack, heavy attack. But if you upgrade him three times, he'll do the full rotation, attack, heavy attack, boom, cleave and take everyone out. And in the metagame talents that you're upgrading, you have the option to upgrade any of those abilities or some. And it's not just damage, right? Sometimes like the priest, his first two attacks are hits, but his third is the heal. So you can throw the priest down, but he won't actually do a big AOE heal or heal anybody up unless you get to that point, unless you upgrade him enough. Uh, but you can't upgrade everybody, right? So you have to make compromises between which heroes you want to put down. Maybe you only put a few number of heroes down, but upgrade them all or do a bunch of heroes and not upgrade any of them. Uh, but there's, it just opens up the door for a lot of cool strategies. Like, for example, I'm on, I had two archers at one point. And on one of them, I only spent talent points on her first ability. Because I was like, okay, I need someone that I'm just never going to upgrade. Because like, I just don't have enough. So I'm going to spend all my points on her first ability, which isn't great. But I know that when I put her down, she's just going to spam her most upgraded ability constantly. And then I don't lose points upgrading anything else. And then the other one, okay, I'm only going to upgrade her third ability, which is super powerful. And then I'll make sure to always upgrade this one. So there's just a lot of interesting choices you make in the course of a single match. And then also through the metagame as you're leveling through about how you want to build these characters. And I never really felt like I got trapped. Like, oh, no, I did this upgrade. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Um I, th there was always good choices, and you just kind of have to change how you use them based on it. And there's full talent refunds and all that sort of stuff with penalties. Because, like I said, this game is fully featured. Anytime I was like, man, I wish I could do this. Oh, I can. <laughs> this feature is in the game. I, I did not expect that. Reason number five, it's re-replayable. So I feel like this episode is going long already, because I just keep gushing about every little feature. So I'll try to keep this one short. So you can play every map on four different difficulty levels from like novice to expert and normal the one you play on is two one out of four so it's the second easiest one and so you get bonus rewards for beating the higher difficulty tiers which you can do the first time or go back and try it later because i had a lot of fun like what I'd, I'd play through the, the through the campaign and i'd kind of reach a point where i was just having a tough time the enemies were really hard so i was like hey, you know what i remember those other difficulty levels i'll just jump to old ones and do higher difficulties and sometimes changes what enemies are there how many how fast they move all that sort of stuff it was really fun to go back and be like oh cool this is like a totally different experience on the same map and I feel, like, better because I go back as, like, a god now, essentially, compared to the power level I had back then because all my dudes are upgraded. So it was really fun for me to do that. And it's also a great way to kind of go back and grind out some XP and money so your dudes get upgraded before you move on to the new zones. And it just kind of makes beating the campaign a little easier. So it's nice because if you just want to power through, if you're super smart, don't duplicate anything. Just play the difficulty level you want and power through everything. But for people like me... If I get stuck on something, just go back, grind a couple older levels on higher difficulties, get some money upgrade, and then I can take on the new challenges again. Oh, and of course, there's tons of achievements, you know, for doing that sort of stuff, if you're into that sort of thing. All right, I'm not doing a very good job of keeping this one short. <laughs> so let's jump into the other part of why it's re-replayable. There are two different game modes, and I guarantee you'll want to play this game at least twice. Uh, assuming you like it. If you hate it, you probably won't. But if you like it, you'll want to play through it at least twice. So the first playthrough, they default you to this game mode where you can have multiple heroes of each hero type. So once you unlock that first Berserker hero, later you'll go to like a prison. Uh, that's one of the spots you go to. And there you can recruit more Berserkers. Um, and so you boost the number of heroes you have in your army till you can like man a huge army. Uh, but halfway through my first playthrough, I, I felt like I was kind of confident enough with my sweet zombie killing that my army was like too powerful and I, I wasn't really having as much fun anymore because it's too easy. And so I decided to start over in the hero mode, which is where you only get a single copy of each hero. 
And at first I thought it'd be really hard based on like, wow, I had like three or four of each of these and I was barely beating some of the levels. Uh, but with just kind of the new strategies I learned and a few trial and errors on certain maps, I was able to figure it out. And it really feels good with the story, especially because the story is such a big part of this game. I liked only having like, there's only the one berserker dude. There's not the berserker dude who also, who looks just like him, but has purple hair and he stands around and never talks. You know, it just felt good to only have, you know, one berserker, one archer, one dragon, that sort of stuff. It kind of built up that feeling of, I kind of mentioned earlier, like I wanted to feel like I was building the fellowship and Lord of the Rings. We're conquering the world together. So having that small band of heroes really felt nice. Reason number six, let's get into the story. There's a bad guy that must be stopped. I haven't really talked about the campaign like story at all. But it's time to rectify that right now. So there's a big campaign map that shows a big chunk of land, mountains, deserts, cave, whatever. Big landmass, right? And you start in one corner. And every time you beat a level, a new path opens up that you can take to the next town or challenge or cave or whatever it is that you're going to be traveling to. And sometimes the path, like, forks, but it usually ends up going in the same place. It's basically a linear path through these levels. Uh, and so you're just crushing around the map, bashing up fools... And the story is mostly told through these cutscenes that you get in between most levels. It's not animated or anything fancy like that. Like I kind of mentioned, the dudes are static, but they kind of change pose and say stuff. Um, but, like I said, the writing is so good that these were super entertaining. Like, I didn't even care that they weren't moving cutscenes in the slightest. Because the writing was so good, I wanted to take my time and laugh about it and pull Jenna over to look at something the guy was saying that was so funny. And it's all, you know, just characters talking trash or becoming BFFs. Whatever. It's good times. So, it's a fun story. It's pretty compelling. But really, what, what really got me was the individual characters, right? Their personalities... And the way they interact with each other is just super fun. It's entertaining. It's like watching a cool sitcom, right? You're just like, wow, what are they going to say to that? Oh, no, he didn't go there. He went there. Oh, man. They're like, why does he have a shoe on his head? This doesn't make any sense, but that's what he's doing. All right. So it's just super fun to kind of watch and see. And like I said, some of them are kind of cliche characters, like the scowling archer that's gruff. But even she has these really cool moments where she breaks the characters or kind of plays off the, the stereotype really fun in funny ways. All right, so the basic premise, let's just get basic premise of the world since I'm talking so much about the characters. This is a medieval fantasy world, and you have magical powers to control others, but you don't know why, and you don't really know how to use them yet. It just started happening, and you're freaking out. And it happened after you got outcast into this wasteland apocalypse. And this is, so this is my best piecing together of the story. The kingdom, there's like this kingdom that's kind of getting more and more insular and whenever like people are cursed or plagued or whatever it is that they think is bad they get kicked out of the kingdom and sent into this wasteland and so a lot of the world is just this apocalypse where everyone that's gotten kicked out of the kingdom is like trapped in there and it's it's like mad max right and so it turns out though the kingdom has been sending a ton of people out there whether they're really plagued or not because some of the people you run into are not plagued and they're normal people doing villages and so there's this whole mystery about okay what's really going on here but most of the land is filled with these monsters and plague zombies now. And there's some jerk who has the same sorts of powers as you do, but they're not a nice guy. So they're controlling all the zombies and making them do bad stuff. And your job is to stop him, right? And that's, that's pretty much all I know, I think. <laughs> um, you've got to stop him, and you're going to stop him by using the same powers he has. And I think some people have talked about a prophecy or something. I don't know. There's some monk that is helping me out, and I'm not sure why. He probably feels bad. I hope it's like the preacher from Serenity. Hope he did some uh, shady stuff in the past. All right. Anyways, reason number seven. You kill lots of sheep. Who doesn't like killing sheep, right? That's, that's a silly point of a game. That could go on the back of a box. Don't judge me. So the enemies you fight are really pretty diverse and sometimes weird. <laughs> this whole game just has kind of this fun quirkiness to it. Uh, and if you haven't noticed with any of my games or maybe with Holy Potatoes last week, I like quirkiness. So there's like slug men that shoot snot balls at you or something. And there's zombies that'll eat your face off. And in one case, you're trying to collect enough mutton to feed a pack of baby dragons. I, I don't... I, is, is a pack of dragons? Horde of, horde of baby dragons? Clan of dragons? Clan of dragons sounds pretty cool, right? I don't know. Like murder of crows. There's all these cool names for like groups of things. I don't know what dragons are. If you know, you should let me know. I'm super curious now. Hmm. Everyone just... Hold on. Just sit here and listen to the silence while I think about this problem. That's how podcasts work, right? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I got it. Let's move on. <laughs> All right, it may sound kind of dumb, but like killing sheep it doesn't seem like a lot of fun. But it's 
actually a fun little side break. It's almost like a mini game. Like, you know, in a lot of like AAA shooters or whatever, they'll have mini games along the way to break it up. That's kind of what it felt like because you're just thrown in this level and these cute little sheep just start spooking it down the hall. And you're like, whoa, I got to stop those things. So you just set up your, your little ice mage and stuff to freeze them. And then the dude with the sword cuts them to little delicious mutton chops. Wait, mutton chops, I think, are are uh, sidebirds. He does not cut them into sidebirds. That would be impressive. Although sheep have wool, you probably could make sweet mutton chops. That's probably where the name comes from. What? We're learning so much on this podcast today. So anyways, <laughs> if Defender's Quest sounds fun to you at all, you can buy it for 15 bucks. I'll have links to all the stores on GameDiplomat.com. I recommend buying it from their website if you're going to buy it. Uh, they'll send you a Steam key and you get a D- DRM-free version. Money goes directly to the developers. It's the best option. Uh, so do that. Um, on the site, it'll have everything else we talked about here along with a video of me playing the game so you can check it out before you buy. And... This is like from straight out of the 90s. This doesn't happen anymore, but Defender's Quest has a demo on Steam. So if you just want to try the game and see if you like it before you buy, you can do it. Just search for Defender's Quest. You'll find the game that's 15 bucks. Then the demo will be a separate entry on Steam. So you have to go to a different page. I'll put a link to the show notes. But even better than all that, you can just win the game for free right now! So Level Up Labs didn't send us any keys to give away, so I'm just going to buy the game for one listener this time. So only one giveaway this time. Sorry, I'm not made of money. But hey, if you want to donate to the show to help cover the cost of buying games, who knows what could happen. You can check out gamediplomat.com forward slash donate to find out more info. Booyah! Plugged it. Alright, to win, just answer this trivia question. Which of these is not a talent you can purchase for your dragon? Halitosis, Strength, Flight, Fatten Up, or Nom? Nom, 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 nom. Email or tweet your guesses to me. Uh, Links on GameDiplomat.com for all that stuff. The correct answer to last week's trivia question about hero names and holy potatoes, a weapon shop, was... Boom, it's a trick question. Got you. All those heroes were in the game, and I love every single one of them, especially Neandolf the Grey. What a great name. (laughs) So congratulations to Shiny Rob, the only person to see through my lies and web of deception and answer correctly. He won a copy of Holy Potatoes, a weapon shop on Steam. It's a lighthearted crafting game about potato people who dance. You can learn more about it on episode eight. And if you enjoyed the show, you can leave a review on iTunes, join our Slack group and Steam group to talk with us about games. We're talking about games right now, including Scott Lance's new game that just came out on mobile today called Plants vs. Zombies Heroes. If you listen to my other podcast, Happy Hearthstone, uh, Scott Lance is a regular on that show. He hosts with me. He's an awesome guy, and he's been working on that game for a long time. So please go check it out. Plants vs. Zombies Heroes, it's free. You can get it on any, any phone, any mobile device, iOS and Android. Check it out. It's fun. You can also donate money to support the show on GameDiplomat.com forward slash donate. Or just tell your friends about us. That'd be rad too. But no matter what, thanks for spending your time with us. I hope you found a fun new game to play. In the next episode of Game Diplomat, we'll talk about Crawl. A competitive dungeon crawler where your friends control the monsters. We'll see you then.
Thanks for watching the video, everybody. Don't forget to check out all the other podcasts at mmoreporter.com or by clicking on any of the links here. And please check out our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash mmoreporter. Thanks, everyone, and see you in game.